special guests for ToonFest, the original developers of Toontown Online. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, our panel of online folks, would you mind introducing yourselves to the crowd? Uh, I'm just going to pick uh, Sean because he's first on the screen over here. So, Sean, take it away. Can, can you hear us, Sean? Oh, we're muted over here. Oh, my gosh, we were muted the whole time. Sorry. Uh, well, everyone in the room just gave you a tuntastic welcome. You couldn't hear the cheers, but they, you could see them. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Wow. Look at all that. And I was just saying, would you all mind introducing yourselves and your role with Toontown Online? And I'm going to start with Sean because he's first on the screen here. Oh, my goodness. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Sean Patton. Uh, I was a, a first an intern at Walt Disney Imagineering uh, with a lot of these fine folks on this call. And and then uh, a couple of years later, I joined Mr. Jesse Shell at Shell Games, uh, and we worked on Toontown Racing. And then I was the design director on Toontown Parties. And yeah, super thrilled to be here tonight. All right, Jesse, what about you? Uh, yeah, hi. I was there at the beginning of uh, Toontown and worked with folks to help get it off the ground. Took I was uh, kind of uh, design directing responsibilities uh, at the beginning, and then. Later on, helped add some of the the features uh, with Sean. So helped get it launched and then added some parts of it um, in the future. All right. Joe, take it away. Yeah, hey, I'm Joe Shockett. Uh, let's see. Joined Disney with Jesse way back in the day in 96, 97. So I was there at the beginning. Uh, my role did a little of everything, but mostly you know game development, programming, design and uh yeah left in 2008 2009 somewhere around there all right uh what about you ellen i was brought in uh april of 2003 right when the beta was launching i believe the second beta i guess that would have been and uh the community manager for uh several years and really tried to champion a tune fest for many years before we got one and I'm super excited that we're here. I did all the trading cards and ran I I worked on printing the trading cards and sending them out to everyone and running all the contests and you know all the all the fun community stuff and I'm really excited. And uh, speaking of contests, you remind me all a couple of you folks have been judging the Toonies, right? Yeah. So I don't know, <laughs> Ellen, what, what category are you judging for the Toonies? I am judging the video category, and I do we, am so excited. Do we have any people in the room who entered the video category? All right, yeah, we've got a couple hands here. All right, and then, Sean, uh, what category were you judging? Uh, cake decorating. That's right, cake decorating right here. <laughs> so a uh, lot, of, lot of excellent entries, look delicious. Wish I could have eaten them, but I just had to sort of get real hungry and then have dessert after I looked at them. <laughs> and uh, Jesse, what about you? I judge the limerick category. All right. And then uh, next, she hasn't introduced herself yet, but she has a Toonies judge as well. Uh, Bridget, how about you? Um, my name is Bridget Kanoka, and I am judging the accessory, accessories um, competition. And I was an art director, and first I started out as an artist in 2003 and worked as an artist for a long time, and then was an associate art director, so. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and Mike, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Sure. My name's Mike Goslin. Uh, I was around at the very beginning. Uh, I was, you know, I helped pitch, pitch the game to the Disney management convince them to let us do it. And uh, I think at the time I was, I may have been the head of the studio or I was, I don't know, it was sort of a weird time. Um, I eventually became the head of the studio, but at, at that time, I'm not sure if I was. Uh, but um, so my role at that, if I wasn't, then my role would have been, I guess, I, I think I had a technical role. I was lead, lead technical or something like that. 
I don't remember what my title was. <laughs> and Mike, I, I'm just going to call out uh, you, you. You you did something quite famous on Toontown. Oh, what was that? There's a there's a certain tune task that you are personally responsible for. Oh yeah, yeah. I wrote uh, I wrote the little old man stuff. <laughs> Everybody, I'm, I'm sure you guys all got to enjoy that. Everybody's know. everybody's favorite tune task. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember the day you did that. It was hilarious. That was me. <laughs> um, but we had because Joe had written the the quest system and, and then we had to like fill it all out and so everybody took a neighborhood and i got the bird and i figured it needed to be pretty hard because it's a bird it's like second to last <laughs> neighborhood so you're welcome everybody <laughs> <laughs> all right uh regine what about you you mind introducing yourself hello i'm reg um i was very early in my career when i started with the team I uh, met Ellen on um, my first day of work, and I can tell you honestly, every person on this call taught me something very interesting. Um, but beyond that, I was with them for four years, and I did support, and I wrote, believe it or not, this is my, my favorite part, is I wrote uh, top tunes. So all of the, the things that you guys were fishing, and you were collecting jelly beans, and you were trying to outdo each other, it happened because Roger kind of tossed a book on my desk and said, we need some leaderboards, but we don't have time to build them in game. What do you think you can do? <laughs> and the answer was, oh, I'll try. So, yeah, that's kind of, I, I think I owe my career to the people on this call. So thank you. Awesome. Very good. Yes. Yeah, they, there were a lot of people, I think, expressing delight and, and fond memories as soon as you mentioned top tunes. So, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I'm sorry, I have only talked to you online, so please let me know if I pronounce this wrong. Gaietto, is, is that right? Gaietto, yeah. Uh, cool, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Yeah, hi, my name is Gaietto John, and I joined VR Studio in 2007, and I stayed until the last, and I was a programmer working on level, level editor, and I worked on the accessory system, then minimap, and things like that. All right. Well, let's give one more hand for all of our awesome Toontown Line developers. <laughs> and now, Jesse, I understand you've brought something special with you to this panel, something never before seen by Toontown fans. It is true, and I, I was going to show some of that. Uh, so I was going to go through. I was going to tell some stories, and uh, and then when we get to the end of that, uh, I'll, I'll unveil that. But yeah. as I was going through my notes, trying because Joey said, "Hey, can you tell some stories from the beginnings of Toontown?" And I said, "Sure." And to refresh my memory, I went and dug through some old files, and uh, I was looking on the online at the files that were that are shared in the repository. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's some stuff that's missing. And I went and dug through my stuff and I'm like, oh, what about the 2001 design document? And I realized that, oh, that's never been shared out. And it has a bunch of things people have probably never seen. And the reason you've never seen them is because it has ideas that were, were proposed to be in the game, but just never ended up in the game. And so we'll take a look at some of those at the end of, uh, you know, uh, after, after we talk about some of the, the, the beginnings. All right, sounds good. So a little suspense there for you. <laughs> well, uh, do you want to uh, take us through? I guess, do you have anything prior to the design document you want to take us through for the beginnings? Or do you want to just Yeah, I was going to. Yeah, before we do. Yeah, I, I just uh, I thought I'd tell a couple stories. I just threw together some slides uh, just to tell some of the tales of how Toontown began. And of course, now I'm with a bunch of people who are going to be like, that's not how it happened. What are you talking about? But that's okay. They, you know, people can call me out when I'm, when I'm making mistakes, but yeah, I thought I would just jump in and if it's okay, I'll just, uh, just tell some of the stories of how it all got kicked off and yeah, then we can open it up to having some discussions and things. All right. So uh, a long time ago in the mid nineties, there was this group called uh, the Disney virtual reality studio. And this group was formed in the early 90s um, with the express idea of putting virtual reality into the Disney theme parks. And there's a, there's a bunch of people in it. A number of them ended up uh, working on Toontown, but this was a kind of a picture of, the, of the, uh, the original VR studio group. Most of what they ended up working on was Disney Quest. Um, you know, yeah, so some people remember Disney Quest fondly. That's excellent. 
Um, a little secret, the very first project that the VR studio worked on was a Rocketeer VR experience. Um, but that never really got off the ground, as it were. Um, and uh, instead, we ended up switching to working on an Aladdin experience. And the Aladdin's Magic Carpet Ride had a few different versions, but uh, this was kind of some pictures from the Disney Quest version. So the VR studio worked on, on this, this kind of groundbreaking virtual reality for Aladdin. And then we worked on this Hercules in the Underworld project that was at Disney Quest, which was this cave-based experience with Hercules. And then that got replaced with this Pirates of the Caribbean experience. And these were just all really cool and exciting. And we were all really glad to be, to be working on this, on this stuff. Um, but once Disney Quest was built, it, it kind of created this kind of like, well, what are we going to do next? And one of the, you know, hard realities of the Walt Disney Company is if you're on a team that doesn't have anything to do, you better, you might have a problem. You know, you may not have a job in a few months. So you always got to make sure that, okay, what are we doing next? And we didn't know because we were focused on VR and we were focused on theme parks and that work was done. And we're all like, man, what a great team. We love working with each other. What are we going to work on? And this was about the time, this by now, this time, it's the late 90s. The internet has shown up, right? Web, web browsers and things have shown up. And we start uh, thinking about some other stuff we've been doing. So one thing we've done on the side was this thing called Toon Tag, which was, uh, this was a, an experience we'd initially created just as an R&D experience just to show here's what a multiplayer game for kids online might be like, which sounds crazy now. Like, of course we know what that is, but back then that didn't exist. All the games that were online multiplayer games were kind of, you know, really, you know, big shoot them up things that nobody was thinking about for kids. And we wanted to show that, no, you could make a game that was a little more kid family friendly. That was a multiplayer. And we'd made this just as a, R&D demo. Four people could play tag in this world. Um, it doesn't seem like much now, but back then no one had ever made like a 3D version of Goofy or Donald. Like this was, this was a bit groundbreaking at the time. And one of the most memorable days for me was when Roy Disney Jr., Roy E. Disney, uh, came by in order to, to, to check it out. And it was really weird. Like I was on one side of the table you know, controlling Donald. And here's like Roy Disney Jr. playing Mickey on the other side of the table. And it was a very surreal moment. And then when it was done, I said, well, you know, Roy, what did you think? And he said, I, I think it was keen. And we're like, I, all right, that's, I guess that's about as good a compliment as you could get. Well, we built this just as a demo. And this turned into something because uh, Disney Online had committed to build this thing called Disney's Internet Zone. Uh, at Epcot Center, it was an installation, but they didn't know what they were going to put in it. And they were desperate to put something in it because they, they didn't really, it was, it was kind of vague. And they, they saw the Toontown, the Toontag demo, and they said, could we put that in it? And so you can see there, this was an experience where four people would go on a stage and play this tag game, um, in, you know, in Toontown with a kind of a live host. And you see four screens and this, this bigger screen showing the map. And that ran at Epcot for about 10 years. So we had done that, but that was like a tiny project. And it was like, what are we, we were still back to the question, well, what are we going to do next? And as we looked at all this internet stuff and we thought about how we'd done the Toontag thing, we realized like that we, that, doing online games could be a great thing for us to do because we knew 3d we were excited about online games and this could be a possibility so we put together this pitch that was all about the online theme park because there was this whole problem of like raising money inside the disney company we knew how to go get fifty thousand dollars to do something and but like if but to make like an online multiplayer game at the time we we're like that's going to cost like five million dollars there wasn't a good way to get five million dollars at the company but we saw that there were ways to get like 50 or 100 million dollars and so we're like well we'll try and do that so we came up with this pitch all about we're gonna make 10 or 20 i think we had like 20 mmos we're gonna make 20 mmos 
and we're going to put a glue them all together so you can jump from one to the other. And we have this big pitch. We're going to have a Space Mountain MMO and a Toontown MMO and just about everything, every Disney property. We were kind of how we're going to make all these different connected MMOs. And it would be the online theme park, right? The Hall of Presidents MMO. I don't even remember how that one worked. Mike, do you still have the the deck from that because i can't find that anywhere that i have it. it it wasn't digital it was in a binder it was like yeah it was old school yeah it was yeah it was way this was before people had did powerpoint very much so we like we were, it was like a paper deck it was crazy anyway so we didn't really think we could build 20 mmos but we knew if we pitched this it was internet times everyone would listen to us so we did this and everyone was like, oh my God, they want to build like 20 MMOs and it's going to be a Disney. So everyone was listening to us. And as we pitched it and pitched it and pitched it and pitched it, eventually somebody said, well, no, we, no, we're not going to fund 20 of them, but we might do one. Well, you know, how about you do one and we'll see how it goes. And really that's all we want was <laughs> to do one. So we're like, oh, I guess so. I guess so. So of course. And when we're just going to do one, of course, we're going to do the best, most sensible one. And it was, oh, well, before I get to that, what it, what it was, <laughs> we had to build this thing. I totally forgot. We have to build this thing. We built the Panda 3D engine because like, you know, nowadays you're making something you'd use in Unity or Unreal or something. We, there, those things didn't exist back then. We had to make our own engine, the, the Panda 3D game engine. This was different. The stuff we'd been doing for Disney Quest was all on Silicon Graphics machines. And the, we knew that anything we built for the home was going to need to be on the PC. We need to build a new engine. So we took everything we learned from doing the Disney Quest stuff and built this new Panda 3D game engine. And what might surprise you is where the Panda 3D engine gets its name. Ostensibly, it stood for Platform Agnostic Network Display Architecture. But what had really happened was an executive came to the VR studio very frustrated. They were, they were frustrated with us. All we wanted to work on was these 3D games, and he didn't think that was important. He thought that we should be working on web pages and using Java, and that's what's important. And we're like, we don't want to do that. We want to work on 3D games. We think that's what's important. And he said, no, you know, the problem, you, your team is, there. You're, you're like a bunch of pandas. All you'll eat is bamboo. And you're going to die because all you eat is bamboo. You need to be more like rats. Rats eat anything. So you need to be less like pandas and more like rats. And uh, so you think about that. And we're like, okay, we'll think about it. And it inspired us to make our new engine and call it the Panda 3D engine. <laughs> and, 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 of course, we needed a file format for it. So we called that bamboo. So you feed bamboo into the Panda engine, and, and that's what made it go. So we, were, we built that engine, and at the same time, we're thinking about what should the game be? And obviously, the simplest, the, the, the most straightforward, best, most popular game uh, for building an MMO about was going to be this, Atlantis. <laughs> Believe it or not, this was the original plan, was we weren't going to build Toontown. Of the 30 MMOs or whatever that we pitched, Atlantis was the one we were going to build. And the reason for that was the Atlantis movie wasn't out yet. And so many people inside Disney were convinced Atlantis was going to be a giant hit. This was going to be Disney's most successful animated film ever made. And this is going to be Disney's Indiana Jones. This is going to be this huge thing. And so everyone was talking about it, what a big hit it was going to be. And so when we went and pitched, this was in our deck of like, we're going to build an Atlantis MMO. And people were like, ooh, oh, that's going to be a big hit. Good idea, good idea. So we actually built prototypes to some extent. We built some avatars. We had a whole pitch for how the whole thing was going to work. And then we, we, once we got it to a certain point, we took it over to feature animation and said, we need, we need to get your buy-in. We're going to do this Atlantis MMO. And they were like, ugh, we don't want you to be doing this you're going to ruin our movie by making a game it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna make people think that this is for kids you're you we don't want games in this so so no you're forbidden you can't make it and we're like oh oh well all right well let's let's go find something that nobody uh nobody really cares about and we did it was two town <laughs> online <laughs> so Toontown was one of the ideas in our deck that we were the most excited about because we'd already built Toontag and we knew the feel of it. 
And we knew that it had Disney right in the center of it. And this picture is actually from one of the decks. What we did is we took this poster, which I think was a poster they used to sell. I don't remember. This was a poster I think they used to sell at Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland. And we, we just put the online part <laughs> under it. And so talking about the inspirations uh, for Toontown, in the beginning, like we were like, Toontown Online, it makes a lot of sense, of course. But what is it? And people may have seen this diagram before in the in the repository from one of the early design documents. This was an early experiment, just kind of exploring what could Toontown be about? Because we hadn't really figured out what it was. And this was an early concept that we turned away from. But the concept was we want Toontown to be a place where like the enemies are all the things kids hate. So we had like we had like this school with like mean teachers and this factory with like evil businessmen and pollution and this city with like, then you see list things like the dentist <laughs> and this neighborhood with a bunch of bullies. And, and you were gonna, you know, the tunes were gonna fight against these things that kids hated. And as we talked about it, it's like, really? We're gonna, we're gonna tell kids that school is evil and like an evil dentist? It's like, this, this might not be the smartest idea. But you'll see the, biz, the, the evil businessman was kind of listed in two of these. And we're like, we kind of like that part of it. And so like this started to become the center of Toontown, the tunes uh, versus these evil, evil business people. And we realized there was this work versus play dynamic that we really liked because not only was it fun and funny and it kind of made sense, but it was something that both parents and kids could relate to because the conflict between work and play is something that kids and parents have to think about and deal with all the time. How much play is too much play? How much work is too much work? And, and it just was very natural. And so this kind of became the center, central idea in, in Toontown. Um, other influences for Toontown that were really important. One, we can't underestimate Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland and its presence there because it's an interesting blend of the Roger Rabbit movie, which, of course, that was the origin of the phrase Toontown. Um, it was but it was a blend of like the Roger Rabbit Toontown and then also kind of Mickey's universe. And even the trolley, you know, for people, you know, you, 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 some people may or may not know the trolley in uh, Toontown Online was based on the Jolly Trolley, which uh, would run around in uh, uh, in Disneyland. I also can't underestimate the importance of the, the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes cartoons, which, of course, Bugs Bunny is a direct inspiration for Roger Rabbit in a pretty clear way. And all the business with like dropping anvils and things, that's not stuff from Mickey cartoons, that's stuff more from Looney Tunes cartoons. So there was a lot of inspiration kind of coming from those. And another really important piece of inspiration that a lot of people don't realize is the Carl Barks universe. So Carl Barks was an early Disney artist who created Duckburg. And he primarily did this through the <laughs> Uncle Scrooge comic books which were just he created his whole world of duckburg and of course people today know it as the ducktales universe but ducktales didn't make it up ducktales took it all from the uncle scrooge uh carl barks universe and then just kept carrying it forward and uh that the thing that was important for us was that was a world like the the whole duckburg wasn't just like a cartoon or a place it was like a whole world where lots of different characters lived and we kept saying to ourselves, the background characters in Duckburg, who weren't all ducks, there were a lot of characters of different types. We really, that, like, that's what we want the people in Toontown to feel like. And some of it was actually quite direct um, because you know, you'll know you notice one thing when you, when you look at this initial picture, which this was, I think, a Bruce Woodside picture, kind of just putting the concept together. One of the things you'll notice about the cog on the left is, that cog is not a cog that is not a robot that's just a, per a person and originally the cogs weren't cogs they were just people and we called them the suits and that was the concept the tunes versus the suits and that ended one day when we had a visit from uh-oh roy <laughs> disney jr comes to the studio he's like hey remember that tune tag that was pretty great what are you doing now 
And we're like, check it out. It's Toontown. It's all about the tunes versus the suits and all that. And he's kind of like, huh, okay, interesting, I guess. And we're like, okay, well, that was a little weird. It, was, it wasn't the warmest meeting we ever had. And the next day, our vice president comes in very perturbed and says, we have a memo here from Roy Disney Jr. who says this game can never ship. Toontown can never ship because it is disrespectful to the people who made this company great. And we all like smacked ourselves in the head and realized, oh, my God. Um, Roy Disney Jr., well, his dad was Roy Disney Sr., who was the businessman who made Disney great. While Walt was the one do doing all the creative stuff, Roy was the CEO of the Walt Disney Company for years and years, quietly in the background making the company great. And here we are with this game saying business people are the evil enemy. And so our vice president's like, deal with this. You're going to have deal, do something. I don't know what you're going to do, but do something. And we're like, oh, my God. Well, we can't. We, what are we going to do? We can't take them out of the game. And we're like, well, what if we, we started brainstorming? What if it's something else? What if it's aliens or the enemy? Now nah, it's corny. What if it's robots or the enemy? We're like, well, maybe robots. But we really want the work versus play thing. And we're like, what if it's <laughs> business robots? <laughs> But we don't tell anybody that. So we wrote a letter back saying, we've changed it. The game is different now. It's going to be all about tunes versus robots. And they're like, okay, fine, whatever. And well, <laughs> we didn't tell them it was business robots. Um, and honestly, the game got better at this point because we were never sure when you defeated a suit what was supposed to happen to them. Bruce Woodside had an original concept where when the, when the suits got hit with too many pies, they would turn into clowns and then shrink really small and run away. And it was like some weird dream. And it was like, Bruce, that's interesting, but uh, that's probably not right. And once we seized onto the cog idea of the, of the, of the robots, the business robots, it was like, oh, this makes more sense because they can explode and it's it's just more interesting anyway. And then it's like, where did these business robots come from? And we're like, oh, let's go to Duckburg and figure it out. So we brought in the idea that Gyro Gearloos invented them um, and to help Uncle Scrooge because Uncle Scrooge wanted to, uh, he, was, he was frustrated that his businesses weren't more efficient. So Gyro's like, I'll help you out. I'll make business robots. And then the business robots want to take over Toontown because they think that's an efficient thing to do. So it was fun to kind of take the Duckburg characters and weave them in to the world of Toontown. And so I was, I was thrilled because I grew up with Gyro Gearloose. He's one of my favorite characters. And to be able to use him in a story, and I could not have been more excited not too long ago uh, when they did the new DuckTales show, there was an episode where Gyro's looking at his notebook and look what's in his notebook. Like he has the cogs in his notebook. And I love this idea that he had them on the good list and crossed them off and realized, oops, that was an accident and puts them on the evil list. But the whole idea that we created something that is now part of the Carl Barks Duckburg universe and, and Gyro Gearless's world I was just something I was very excited about. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to tell just a couple more quick stories about origins, unexpected origins of certain things in Toontown. One of them are the knock-knock doors, um, which are so cute and fun. But why are they there? Why did we put them there? They don't really serve any gameplay purpose. They showed up because initially um, when we were making the towns, I remember this was a discussion with, with Felipe Lara making the kind of prototype neighborhoods, there were all these doors to make the town look like a normal town. Like, of course there's doors on buildings. And then of course people would run up, how do I open it? And we're like, we can't open all these doors. This, we can't afford to bake all these interiors. It's too expensive. I'm like, Felipe, get these out of here. We can't open them, take the doors away. So he's like, okay, I'll take the doors away. Twix takes the doors away. And now the town looks super weird. It's just all these walls. Right. We had an occasional door, but like walls and walls and walls and walls. We're like, ugh, that looks terrible. We can't have doors you don't open. We can't have doors you do open. What are we going to do? 
And somebody came up with the idea of like, well, what if you knock on them and they tell a joke and that's it? And we're like, oh yeah, of course people want to interact. They don't need to necessarily go in and we're like, knock, knock jokes are cheap. So like we can, we can do that. So that's how that idea uh, came about. Another one, this is a, here's a, a, Mike, a Mike Goslin thing here, uh, talking about Lil Oldman. P some people may not realize the, the origin of, of the name of this character. Uh, there was a Mel Brooks movie called High Anxiety, who uh, has this funny character played by Howard Morris, who's kind of a funny character actor. I think Howard Morris is the gopher in Winnie the Pooh, actually, as a, as a matter of fact, but he plays a lot of interesting characters. Um, and he plays a character in this named Professor uh, uh, Lil Oman. Um, but, and the joke is everyone always calls him, oh, are you Professor Lil o Man? And he's like, it's not Lil Oman, Man, it's Lil Oman. It's just this, this, I don't know. And we thought this character was funny and Mike was, was kind of riffing on that. So there's like part of the secret origin of Lil Oldman was, uh, was in the Mel Brooks movie. Um, another unexpected origin is secret friends the whole system by which you can kind of establish friends with somebody and type messages back and forth this came from an idea of it from another disney uh game called disney girlfriends and disney girlfriends was this game where if you had it and your friend had it you could play multiplayer online games together by connecting your modems, I think, or something. I don't remember how it worked, but you would get one friend to another friend, and it worked by you'd request the secret code from the game, and then uh, the, and you'd tell it to your friend, and then they'd type that secret code, and then the system would connect you together. And it was a way that you kids could be online but be safe because they'd requested these secret codes. And we're like, uh, we were really looking for ways to keep kids safe online. And we're like, that's pretty smart. Disney Girlfriends as a product was kind of crazy silly because what are the chances that there's a multiplayer game that you buy in the store and you can only play with your friends who have it? It's like selling one walkie talkie. Like, what are you doing? Um, so it didn't really do very well as a product, but that was a smart idea. And we borrowed that idea for the secret friends system um, and worked, worked very well. Um, and then the, the last little uh, story to talk about would be the origin of the, of the, the trading cards and the, and the newsletters. This was, uh, I know Joe and I were very passionate about this as a concept. We kept thinking about like, oh, we want this to feel like a club and kids are part of the club. Wouldn't it be cool if you, as soon as you joined and you paid that you start getting stuff in the mail and you really feel like you were part of this club. And we were excited. It was going to be stickers. And wow. that, what I think was the original concept was all about stickers. And we go to marketing and we're like, yeah, we want to do this. It's going to be great. And they're like, wait, you're saying this game where kids pay $6 a month you're going to, what are we going to spend a dollar a month mailing this out? We're just going to give them that for free, for like free, like a free dollar a month. You're going to do that. That's the plan. And we're like, yeah. And they're like, no, that's, this is a business. What are you talking about? We can't just give away a dollar a month to everybody. Like that doesn't make any sense. Get out of here with that. And we were kind of bummed. And then we're like, well, maybe we need to think about it from their point of view, because, you know, it is kind of a lot of money, a dollar a month. It's not nothing. And we were thinking about, well, what do they really care about? And as we thought about it and talked about it more, we realized the way the, the marketing people thought about it is they thought about what does it cost to get someone to how much do they need to spend on advertising to get someone to to buy a subscription. And then once they bought the subscription, we want to keep them as long as possible. And it was like, oh, wait a minute. So like they're expecting the subscription lasts a certain period of time. And we're like, we think that if you get this in the mail, it's going to make the subscription last longer. So we went back to them and said, OK, OK, OK. We're not here to tell you about how cool it is. We're here to talk about a terrible moment, the moment a subscription gets canceled. And they're like, what are you talking about? We're like, OK, we're going to talk about when a subscription gets canceled. Here's how a Toontown subscription is going to get canceled. A parent is alone at night. The kids have gone to bed and they're paying the bills and they're going through the credit card and they're like, what? $6 a month. 
what am i still paying this does my kid even play this i don't know if they do i'm going to cancel this that's when this happens and that's when it's going to happen now imagine that there's a universe where we send a mailer once a month what happens when kids get a piece of mail and the marketing people are like well kids love getting mail they'll be excited i'm like right and it's a piece of mail from disney now what's going to happen you just created a moment where the, the parents are going to uh, get this thing in the mail, hand it to the kid, and they're going to see the kid be like, oh, awesome, that's amazing. You can't tell me that that's not going to make the subscription last two extra months. And they're like, oh, my God, it probably would last, last two extra months. I'm like, right. So if the average subscription is six months, how much does this cost us to do? They're like, oh, that's like $6. And I'm like, what if we extend it by two more months? They're like, wait. So it costs us $6, two more months, that'll cost us $8, but we'll make $12. And I'm like, right. They're like, we can't afford not to do this. <laughs> right? And, and it totally worked and we got it off the ground. And I will add that the, the, um, the trading cards were very special to me personally uh, because after I left Disney and uh, the, the, the way shell games started was Mike was like, hey, we need someone to help write these trading cards. Do you have time to do that? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And I ended up starting Shell Games initially as a consultancy where my job was writing all the text on the backs of the trading cards. So, so the Toontown trading cards were actually at the very beginning of Shell Games. Um, there you go. So the last one I'll, I'll just mention is I mentioned I, I wrote the, a lot of the stuff on the trading cards. And so th these were always very special to me. And uh, the juggling cubes, like I, juggling has always been a hobby of mine. And, and I used to actually be a professional juggler. And like one of the ones I just love pointing at is, uh, you know, the little joke on the back here, Jeff and Jesse's jocular juggling cubes. Uh, Jeff was my best friend growing up and the two of us always juggled together. And we were roommates in college and we started the college juggling club. And so it was nice to be able to kind of sneak that in there um, as, a, as a little tribute to, uh, to a friend of mine um there you go anyway that's the end of my slides right there um so thanks very much yeah thank you so much jesse and now so we don't have a lot of time to to dive into it deeply but you mentioned that there's this this 2001 oh. design document right uh, yes you're yeah. right any quick uh, things you want to say about that yeah, um, let me, yeah, I know we don't have time to go into it too deeply, but let me just pop it up for one second and I could show you a little, a little glimpse of it before it, uh, it kind of goes up uh, online. I'll just give you just a quick, uh, quick peek at it here because I know we want to get to the Q&A as soon as we can. All right, there, this is probably it right there. All right, so there it is, Toontown Design Document version 2.6. Um, and it's got a lot of interesting things in it. First of all, it's longer than any of the design documents that the other ones, this one has 116 pages long. So it definitely has a lot more stuff. And just a couple interesting surprises that are in it. Let's see, I don't know, I can find some stuff real quick. Uh, oh yeah, stuff about the hotel room, which was the, one of the original Toontown concepts. And there were some other things. There's something in here about the, the trade. Oh, there it is. The trade interface that we were going to use to trade back and forth. And then I know farther in here is the original, uh, a lot of the original mini game concepts. Uh, some of which just never happened. And those, I think people will have fun poking through. Uh, oh, yeah, there are some descriptions of some of the lands that never got built, like Goofy Stadium and uh, a few of these others. But, like, yeah, so and so you, you can have fun poking through and learning about uh, the cheese shop minigame that never happened. Uh, or, like, the cannon game was originally called Boomatoon. I don't know why we didn't keep that. That's a better name. <laughs> Um, and also fun in here is you can kind of see there are some comments from uh, some of the other Imagineers about these. I think a number of these are actually from Daniel Osheim here. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of fun stuff you can dig through here. Um, and people have a, uh, should have fun checking that out, I think. 
Yeah, so we'll be getting this uploaded to the Toontown Preservation Project later this weekend. You'll be able to access it by going to toontown.online. And yeah, thank you so much, Jesse, for digging up this piece of history for us. Okay. So, Joey, I'm going to stop the screen share, okay? Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're free to kill the screen share. All right. All right. So let's just dive right into questions, uh, since I know we don't have a ton of time with you all. But uh, I, I wanted to start by actually uh, directing a question towards Ellen, because uh, Ellen, as you mentioned, you had a big role in the original Tune Fest, and so now you know we have all these people here celebrating 20 years of Toontown at, at Tune Fest 2023, and I kind of just wanted to hear from you: How did the first Tune Fest come to be? What was that like? The process of you know, getting Toontown Online players in person together. Oh, I think Ellen, we, you're, we muted. you're muted. Thank you. There you go. Uh, before I came in to Disney, my job, I worked for StarTrek.com and I would go to Star Trek conventions and talk to fans there and their photo and take photos of them and put them on the official site. So the minute I like loaded up Toontown and saw it, that's when the original Toon Fest idea popped in my head. Like, we have to get these people in their costumes of their characters together somehow, someday. Uh, it took several years of other events that marketing, we worked in conjunction with Disney Channel. They were very, very clear that if we were doing any kind of event, it needed to have a lot of presence on in marketing channels like Disney, you know, Disney Channel would run an interstitial covering our event if it was featuring enough Disney Channel folks. So the Grand Prix we did, and the uh, didn't we we did something else? Oh, the we did a charity event that was very uh, focused on Disney Channel stars, and we had a few contests so people could come to those events, but it wasn't really about the fans. It wasn't until 2006 that uh, I think we had finally gotten enough momentum and the fan sites were exploding and there was enough uh you know interest that we had convinced them that we should do a proper tune fest so the first one was on the studio lot in 2006 and then the following year we did uh fantasia gardens at walt disney world in conjunction with the launch of acorn acres so it was like a golfing themed event and uh yeah that was those were some of the most exciting, you know, events I've been to. It was so thrilling watching everyone come together and put their costumes on and just, you know, tune out together. Awesome. And do you happen to have any advice for, you know, we're just kicking off Tune Fest. We got three more days of it here. Do you have any advice for fans to make the most of, of their weekend at Tune Fest? This is where I'm going to cry because I'm just so excited that the fans are still fanning and uh, that you all are together and, you know, be excellent to each other and, you know, give everyone, you know, jelly beans and hugs and tune-ups all over the place. Yay, thank you. And uh, yeah, just be your awesome, amazing tune selves. Thanks for being the best, easiest community to manage really ever. Because you're all so great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll move away from Ellen over to now, uh, uh, Reg. I understand uh, that you also had an interesting role to play in the Toontown community. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you provided support for some of the international versions of the game. Is that right? Oh, they sent me away to go launch them. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> so each of our international versions were actually launched via partners. Um, so I'm trying to remember the name. So I think we had. I want to say one of them was Telefonica, one of them was Orange, um, pulling here. But so we launched it in the UK. We launched, which believe it or not, you're like, wait a minute, the UK, that, that's also English. But there's a whole other culture over there, folks. Um, we launched it in Spain. We launched it in France. We, I believe we had a Fili the Philippines. We had Toontown Japan. We had, so we had all of these different cultures. And you, at, back in the day, they... It was like, okay, just translate the game and off you go. And Toontown didn't do it that way. And that's what made it so special. They made it so that it was culturally relevant. So we had Bastille Day. 
when they were having different holidays there, we were very aware of the, the cultural differences. Don't get me wrong. A lot of the times it was, it was um, <laughs> American holidays first. Uh, but when you were launching the actual game, there, it, they made it culturally relevant to the players. So it wasn't just about like accept, our, accept the American culture and off you go. It was make it unique to them. And you, you found that you had a lot of people. The other, the other fun part is quick chat. It translated for you, so you didn't have to speak the other person's language. You just chatted between each other, and you could have a conversation with someone who didn't remotely speak your language. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of people. I now live in the UK, which probably came from that first trip that <laughs> you guys sent me over there. So thanks for that as well. It's just going to be a love fest for me today. Um, but knowing all of these different <laughs> thanks, Helen. Um, but knowing all of these these different things, uh, we had to provide support to these players. So it was making sure that we provided not just, hey, I've got this thing that's broken, but also, hey, that that localization isn't quite right, or hey, that's slightly offensive. Uh, can you please fix it for us? And those were the, those building out that team is, is actually what I did. So anyway, I'm not sure if that's where you wanted to go with the question, but that's where I've taken you. You you perfectly answered it. The The question was going to be one from uh, Gigi, just a special shout out to them, who is one of our community members who asked just what went into supporting all that. And I think you, you totally covered it. And actually, I know there's some people in the room here who have traveled from other countries to come to TuneFest. Uh, do you all want to raise your hand in the audience here? We got a couple My in people. the back. Where you at? There's some all, a couple around the room here. I think we, we tracked, how long was the, the longest flight to come here? 22 hours. 22 hours. Someone's oh, traveled wow. 22 hours to come to TuneFest. Thank you. And I think that is in large part thanks to your work in supporting the international community with Toontown. Uh, now, uh, I'll move to uh, another one for uh, Sean, actually. So, Sean, you mentioned you started uh, working on Toontown as an intern. You later sort of moved up into Goofy Speedway, eventually design directing for, for parties. What was that like, I guess, like, you know, going out from so early in your career, working on the game in these different roles? And do you also happen to have any advice for, say, aspiring game developers looking to get an internship on something like Toontown? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, I, I went out to Walt Disney Imagineering not really knowing what to expect there were i think there were three of us that were going out from from my graduate school and uh we were working on different things but i was i was working with jesse and joe and mike and and roger and those guys and uh, i think you guys put me to work on some 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 tune uh tune maker stuff like sort of re revamping some of that and then and then on this you know i graduated to some work on some mini games match mini and things like that uh but it was just it was just wild to like you know you know, doing Python and doing, you know, you're like, here, here's a game that people don't say, you know, they say it's not very good. Can you make it better? They're like, ah, maybe. And it was just, you know, you, you threw me right in there. You treated me as part of the team. And it was just awesome. And I think, you know, that that's something we definitely try to do at Shell Games. Like we put our interns on, you know, important parts of the game. And it's like, hey, you know, that's, that's the best way you're going to learn. And you get treated as part of the team. And it was awesome. And so, yeah, when Jesse, Jesse was a great boss and he was a great professor. And, um, and I, I guess I must have made a good impression because because you called me up later. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I you know I was very fortunate in my career path, and I, I think that you know as far as uh, as far as advice to folks, you know uh, work work you know work on projects with your friends. Um, you know get a you can you can work on you can use the same engines we use, right? Unity and Unreal. You can download those. You can make projects with your friends. You can put them up on your website. And I know at least when we're hiring folks at Shell Games, right, we're looking at, you know, are, is this person really excited about game development? And, you know, you know, do they enjoy it? Is it something they enjoy? Is it something they can work on with other folks? Can they collaborate? Uh, can they speak the different languages? Designer, engineer, artist, right? And, you know, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, you know, do the global game jam every year from Sri Lanka to Hawaii. Hundreds of game developers working on thousands of games, you know. Uh, Get get some get some stuff up in your portfolio. Talk about the game that you made. What worked? What didn't? Can you can you analyze it? Can you see what worked? Uh, can you describe why it didn't work and what you'd change if you had more time? These are all the things that that I learned and that we look for. So, and have have some fun out there. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, speaking of fun, Sean, I, we have a game of yours at the Toontown booth. Do you, you want to tell anyone about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So uh, Joey, Joey is very nice, and um, and I, he he was explaining how you guys are going to have Toontown themed board games. And I was like, ah, I make board games, um, and Tin Spin, Tin Spin is I think the game that's there, uh, and it's the first ever game to use dice spinning as a mechanic. Because why roll dice when you can spin them? Am I right? Uh, Jesse's got a copy. <laughs> but yeah, Tin Spin is, is a fun game. And uh, yeah, you should totally, totally play some Tin Spin. Check it out online. Uh, and yeah, super, super excited. And I think I think it's going to be one of the prizes for for at least the cake decorating contest, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, the winner of the cake decorating contest will get their own copy of Tin Spin. Uh, this <laughs> panel has also been brought to you by Tin Spin. So. <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't have that kind of budget. <laughs> and I'll send you I'm, a bill, Sean. Don't worry. Quick tin spin trivia. Um, that's actually a game that Sean made in my game design class when he was one of my students. What was that, Sean? 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah. 21 years ago. Right. He, he'd done it as an assignment in class. And I was like, wow, this is really fun. And he's like, maybe I'll do something with it one day. And a few years ago, Sean's like, I'm actually going to take this to Kickstarter. So uh, things that start out as a simple student project can turn into a, a real product if you want to. Jesse wrote a quote on the Kickstarter. It was like, I've been waiting for this game for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true, baby. <laughs> Uh, so we've got another community question here, this time for Bridget. Uh, this is from Derp Kirby, who said, when creating new accessories and clothes for tunes, which I know, Bridget, you, you did quite a bit of, uh, were there any significant rules you had to follow to fit the game's art style? And do you have any examples that you'd be willing to share about it? Um, I think at the very beginning, when I first started, um, we were trying to stick pretty close to the original um, design of, you know, like the Warner Brothers style and the original um, tune design. But then um, we wanted to make, uh, and I also wanted to make more and more outfits for the tunes. And the original ones, they were li just a little boring, you know? I mean, they're they're all right to d dress your avatar up, and but then you want something, you know, kind of stylish and kind of cool. Um, so I, as long as we stuck to kind of bright colors and kind of a toony feel, um, we kind of pushed it more in that direction. And I think w I can remember like one of the things that was a little like iffy at the beginning was um, I made a tie dye shirt. <laughs> and I know some people were like, Ooh, I don't know about the tie dye shirt. That's like not in this realm. Like, I don't know. I don't know. But then uh, luckily we will let it go through. And I think it was pretty popular. So that was one example of kind of pushing it more towards just like the fun, wacky side and not really being stuck to the old, you know, 1940s or whatever uh, cartoon look. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, uh, another thing about the Toonie Awards, the winner of the accessory design contest that Bridge is judging will have their item actually put into Toontown Rewritten as a an item that you'll be able to Yay. to use so you'll be able to say that you know the original accessory creator from for all sorts of different <laughs> tune accessories has approved your your design <laughs> yay i'm excited i'm excited for that <laughs> bridget you also uh, used to help judge the fan art contests as well and you would help take those designs and put them in the game back then as well. that's true that's true i did that in, for the game so we would uh we'd also get together and decide which ones uh, were the best. And I know Ellen sifted through a bunch as well. And yeah, that was super fun to do. And I think people really liked uh, getting their, their artwork in the game. And it was, then I would paint it up and we put it in, so. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just recently, uh, I someone in the community had spoken up that uh, they were one of the designers of a shirt that you all had judged and put into the game, and they had the, oh, the original yeah. scan of it. I think it was the fishing shirt. Oh, oh the watermelon yeah. Shirt, the watermelon yeah, shirt. I remember that shirt. So, yeah, yeah. it was the, the watermelon shirt. They're, they're still a member oh, of the Toontown yeah. community. They, <laughs> I remember uh, that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they said they were, they were brought to tears when, or something when they learned that their, their shirt was being put into the game. Uh, so mm. it's just a testament to the impact that, that you all have had through just su supporting this community. That's uh, awesome. Now, I, I want to uh, pose a question to uh, Gaeto. I believe you have the unique perspective here as being one of the 
one of maybe the only developer here who was with Toontown all the way to the very end in 2013. Uh, and so we, just as someone who was there in, in some of those later days, uh, I guess what was it like on the team? How do you think it, it differed from the earlier days of the project? And were there any yeah, things that you didn't like really get to finish or, or complete that you were hoping to before the game closed? That, that's the thing actually I uh, asked them about how, how honest I can go with this question and then everyone said I can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, it was like uh, Disney, actually their in, uh, attention was actually moved on to another project at the time. So it, it, they are pulling up people from this project and then uh, almost at the end they, we are only one engineer working on this game, So which was not me. It was Justin. <laughs> so it, it, it became down to three of us and then two of us and then only one person working on both Toontown and Pirates at the same time. Then they just put it away. So it was really sad days. Actually, I remember that earlier days, we were all like, we are studio, have our own culture. We are working really together in very funny ways. And then that whole culture is kind of gone and then we became more like, cocks in a way and then they finally pulled down pulled the plug off but luckily tunes registered and then rewritten the history i'm so love to watch it. all this tune rewritten becomes alive and so what was your reaction when when you heard for the first time that like you know the fans were, were going to try and bring toontown back was it uh, oh yeah my first reaction was is it even possible <laughs> <laughs> that was ours. you don't know about this <laughs> awesome and um you know speaking of of the other projects um mike i, I believe you not only oversaw toontown at one point but also uh fairies and, and pirates online uh world of cars online maybe uh so it, what was it like i guess how did toontown pave the way for those other Disney MMOs, and is there any like lessons that you learned from Toontown that were put into those other games later on? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we kind of got back to the original idea of the online theme park. We you know we had pitched we're going to do twenty of these, and uh, when Toontown worked, and we you know this crazy thing about Toontown is they told me I needed a business model to to get funding for the project and we didn't have any business people on our team we were a we were a studio you know we had animators and you know engineers we didn't have any business people so i i got into excel and i made a spreadsheet and i got i had some help from some people like hey what do you think that this is going to cost and we built this model and uh i i don't know how it happened but it was spot on like we we hit exactly the revenue numbers that we had put in this model, this crazy model that we just cooked up. And so the result of that is they thought we were just geniuses. About <laughs> business. And so they let us do whatever we want. There was a period of time where we could just say, all right, we're going to do this game and here's what it's going to do. And they were like, okay, fine, here you go. Here's the, you know, back the money truck up and, and start making these games. So we, we learned a couple things. One is the, you know, figuring out all the, the safety and the chat and and by the way you know you guys are the best community ever but despite that there is still a lot of stuff going on that we had to um, kind of police and uh so that was a big learning and as we expanded to these other games you know we, we were able to use the same system um I'll, I'll tell you one kind of funny story so the 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 bad word filter started with me and uh, greg wiatrowski uh, we, we went out uh, and bought some beer and we just sat down and started coming up with all the all the most profane things we could think of. And that was the beginning of, of the, the bad list. Um, and it eventually grew to be in, I think, something like 10 different languages. I mean, it it was like a massive thing. And I think we were the first ones really to do it was that. To have a, so much bigger than that, Mike. Matt took it over at some point and created an algorithm that took Dante's Inferno and figured out what I know, guys, what series of phrases in five word chunks would the likelihood you would find them in that book. And then based on that ratio, that's how 
much we knew whether this was a bad phrase or a bad conversation to flag. And all of that was in every language we were supporting. It was, yeah, they, I'm, it was so impressive for the time. And now I look at what we're doing today and I'm, I'm still like, Matt built a better one. Um, Cause it was just, it, it's just unreal. And yeah, but tunes on the whole were, were a wholesome bunch. We were very lucky. Sorry, Mike, I didn't want to interrupt you there, but it no, was no, that's, so that's, much bigger than just the original profanity list. Yeah, I think that's the that's the theme here is like everything we started, you know, with this kind of small team in one room turned into this massive business. We had, you know, I think five, five of these at one point um, all going at the same time uh, globally. We were in all these places and we had this great map. Somebody somebody took a Google map and put a pin for every live player on it. And it was just amazing to see that thing. We were covering the whole planet and and you could see when people were coming on, you know, like there's this like wave after the kids go to bed, there's this wave of adults would sign in. <laughs> like that's when we knew we were really onto something is when, you know, the they they would tell us that there were multiple players per household. So our our subscription numbers weren't really the story. It was really you know, how many people in the house were playing together. And a lot of times it was the parent it was one of the, the primary players. Um, so yeah, we, we learned a ton. We, we used it in all the other games, but each one was a little different. They were, you know, trying to go after different audiences. Um, I think we overreached with pirates. We tried to like do this, this thing that was so huge that we almost, almost killed the team trying to build it. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was, uh, it really was the online theme park for a while. We had, we kind of got about, you know, a good chunk into the original plan, lar largely because Toontown worked so well. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, the OTP server. So we even, we even tried to build a metaverse uh, where you could have tunes and pirates hanging out together. And that was kind of wild. And I had a running uh, on, on my computer and we would bring execs in and show them and they're like what is this what <laughs> what on earth this will never fly you'll never you'll never be able to that, get approval for this but that was built part, it. it was part of the original uh, online theme park pitch i think we call it the vista viewer or some crazy thing where where you could go between the worlds and then later we're like that's actually that's a terrible idea <laughs> <laughs> it sure was cool to walk around and yeah just, you know it's kind of like this backstage kind of idea and there was you know you could just walk from one it was really like a theme park you could walk from one area to the other and run into all the different kinds of characters um, that's the nice thing about doing it all on panda it was it was all the same engine so we could we could cross over like that so uh, we've got a couple other community questions here that uh, I'll try and do a little bit of a round robin for. It, first, there, there's two community questions that I know a lot of people in here are wondering. Uh, specifically, these are coming from someone named Speedster and someone named Darth M. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start with Joe for this. But Joe, if you don't know, feel free to pass it to anyone maybe brave enough to answer. Uh, there were a couple urban legends of Toontown before the game closed that went unanswered. For example, there was uh, the Cog Nation crates in Cashbot headquarters, which everyone's always sort of speculated, like is there some giant Cog headquarters out there called Cog Nation? Well, I don't know, is there anything you can say about that, of, of what your discussions were internally? I, I, I do remember we were trying to build Cog headquarters for every track of Cogs. I, I do remember that. Those were added late in, in the game. I worked on a couple of them, designed a couple of them. Uh, but boy, I'll have to pass it to Gato. Do you do you remember this lore, Gato? Because that might have been after my time. Or or Jesse? Yeah. Co Cognation, I do not. I've seen the crate. I don't I don't know who put that there or what they were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so another one that is uh, the chairman of the Cogs. And so when you defeat the the CEO, he says the chairman's not gonna like this as he's defeated. And we never met the chairman in Toontown. Did, were there any discussions of what the chairman might be? What, what, one thing I'm reminded of is when you do world design, there's this concept of distant mountains. 
uh, that Tolkien talks about. Uh, you don't just design the things in front of you that you're interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis, the characters. You also design, yeah, things you may never get to, you may get to someday. And, and so I think the chairman was one of those that like, we, we might get to him someday, but uh, I don't remember ever any design docs or anything specific. Does anyone else? Uh, well, Joe, now that you say that, I happen to have a design doc right you have here. A different yeah. Is there a board of directors potentially at some point? Uh, it, we had discussed this rescue of Sco Scrooge McDuck was actually in the design document at one point um, where there, the, we, I don't know if we called them the, I don't know if we called him the chairman back then. You can tell we're in the deep in the design document. It's all TBD, 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 TBD. We don't know what any of this is. Um, but uh, there was this whole idea of Scrooge McDuck held hostage by a giant robot uh, and fighting this, this giant robot in a climactic final battle. Uh, and there was a little map of Scrooge McDuck's vault and how it's connected in. Um, that, yeah, we talk about defeating the head cog, uh, but like you say, this was yeah. pretty vague. Yeah, I, I think yeah. even in even in the best virtual world design, you don't want to design everything up front. You want the community to come along the ride, and 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 you want the community to tell you what they're enjoying, what they're not enjoying, where you should spend your time. So um, yeah, you can drop little crumbs like that and see who bites and then chase it. And so the last urban legend that I, I have here is the, the under construction tunnel in Acorn Acres. And so when, when Chippendale's Acorn Acres was added, there was a tunnel with a construction barrier that remained under construction until the day the game closed. Do you, any of you have? Thoughts, ideas, maybe designs of, of what that might have been? I remember a few. There was a stadium. There was a black and white. There was uh, a black and white neighborhood. Yeah. Black and white neighborhood. Uh, Jesse, you know I'm going to bring up the Vortex neighborhood. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought, I thought I was the only one who remembered that. Um, yeah. We, yeah, we, do, do we have a name for it? It was like upside down something. I don't even know. But yeah, yeah no, it was it was a, it was meant to be a, a playground where so it was supposed to be like really weird where gravity didn't make sense. And in the center of the playground, the ground came up into a pillar, and then the pillar extended onto the ceiling, and so that you could like walk right up the wall and then be walking around on the ceiling. So in the playground, there would be tunes walking on the floor. And also this playground would have a ceiling and they'd be walking around up there. And uh, David Rose told us to get lost, that the uh, he could never make the gravity work that way in Toontown. And we're like, this okay, was, yeah. This was 15 years before Inception, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, that's, that's, all, that's, all, that's all true. But I did, like, that Acorn Acres under construction gateway, that didn't happen. Like, that was after I had stepped away and was was the idea to add another neighborhood? Do you guys know at that point? Yeah, I think I think we wanted to add another. I don't remember which one we were going to put there though. The, Greg might know. He'd be a good person to ask. Okay, it's funny. Nobody seems. To, I've talked to I've talked to Greg. I've talked to Felipe. I get different stories. Some some there was something about someone was saying, oh, we were there was a golf course. A mini golf was going to go back there. I don't know. Like I've heard so many different stories about what that was going to be so it's yeah i thought it was mini golf and we were talking about mini golf and skiing and like all sorts of things like that but it, i don't know what, yeah what it cost i feel you? like i i remember making the sign that goes yeah, there so mini golf did end up what, in the game mini, mini golf was, was going in there. behind the sign uh so. but I, I think there was the skiing one is interesting because sean i don't know if if you have any memory of this i know i've i've seen at shell games before there was tune parties there was tune ice skating tune ice do you skating. do you remember that i do because we were uh <laughs> we were playing a lot of ssx tricky around that time if i remember correctly uh and uh, and we were like oh this game's great and so there was there was talks of getting that sort of you know pulling tricks and like doing cool moves as tunes and so kyle kenworthy who was an extremely talented 
uh, animator at the time at Shell, did 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 some like yeah, like here are some tricks, and we were all very excited about it. And then yeah, there were there were issues and and and, and development issues. Uh, why I never saw the light of day, but. But yeah, it was definitely it was definitely there was a lot of SSX tricky being played at lunch in that time period. Uh, and I happen to have a design document right here <laughs> that, uh, that talks about how skating is going to be integrated into the berg. How you walk on the ice and suddenly you'll have ice physics. Ice physics. That was yeah. That was pre us then. <laughs> that was a long time ago. There you go. Ice skating, it's destined someday. <laughs> so we only have just three minutes until I think Momocon's gonna give us the boot from this room, but I'm just gonna open this up to a question for any or all of you. Uh, this is a question from uh, Super Bubbles Boing and Boing, who said, what is your fondest memory of working on Toontown Online? Anyone wanna start with that? Feel free to use the, the Google Meet raise hand. Oh yeah, Ellen, go for it. Just the Tune Fest, getting to interact with the community face to face was always the best part. You know, it's one thing to read all of your messages and emails and hang out on the fan sites, but getting to actually talk to people who love this game and want to be together is the best. I I can tell you my favorite memory by far, uh, and that was the day that Toontown rewritten opened. Oh. Uh -oh. Because I, the thing I want to make clear about when we, part of what made Toontown special was had a bunch of people working on it who'd been working on Disney theme park stuff, and working on that we didn't think like normal video games, which is like oh the game's going to come out next Christmas and it'll be popular for six months. We thought about we're going to build this and we want it to be up for twenty years. We want people to be playing this twenty years from now. And ten years later, when Disney decided to close it. It was a super dark day and we were all really sad. It was incredibly depressing for all of us because our, our vision of this game being here in 20 years, 30 years, it, it ended that day. And except that you guys saved Toontown. So thanks. I know that's a hard one to top. Does anyone else have any final thoughts before we wrap up? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll add one. I mean, this happens maybe once a year or, or you know, thereabouts. I'll run into somebody who will, I'll, I'll have, I don't know, they'll either recognize me or I'll have something associated with Toontown. They'll come up and say, hey, you know, that was my childhood. Like, that's, that's what I did. I grew up in that game. And like, it, it never, it never gets old. I mean, when people, people tell you like they've spent time and, you know, this is, it was something that really had an impact on them. Like that's, that always makes me, you know, just, it, it, it's so humbling, like just to have that kind of ability to, you know, to, to impact so many people. I mean, and, and it happens all the time, even still, I've, I, I've run into people and just, you know, so many people feel so strongly about something that, that we work so hard on. And it's, you know, it's just a great feeling. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys get that too now. I mean, it's, you know, we, this thing is, is just going to yeah. keep going. Yeah, I know. It's, it's the players. I remember when Joey asked Jesse and I to speak at the Toon Fest in Pittsburgh. And we were like, we got there and we were like rock stars. And we're like, do we deserve this? Like, it was just like, right? So, yeah, I think. It's just really awesome what the Toontown rewritten folks have done to to keep this magic alive and for everyone who's playing it. It's great. It's amazing. 20 years. Awesome. Well, thank you amazing. all. Thank you all so much for being here. Let's give it here a round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you, Joey. Yeah. You, you all are amazing. We're so happy that you've been a part of TuneFest. I know some of you will be stopping by later on for the Toonie Awards, so we'll, we'll see a couple of you again. But again, thanks for being here. Uh, a special surprise for everyone in this room. We have the 2020 TuneFest posters that we never got to give out that you can take on your way out. Uh, so uh, thanks again, everyone. <laughs>
Yes, thanks again, everyone. Have a great night, and we will see you tomorrow for another day at TuneFest.